All this is Dr. Mobin Sayed from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. So I hope that the network is doing better today. If not, then I will have to rewire the Ethernet cable and I may have to do that over the weekend. Uh, remember for tomorrow, we will have Dr. Daryl DeMello speak with us tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time instead of tomorrow evening. So with these two, let's start our discussion. We'll continue with the androgens or male hormones. So let me give you a summary of the androgens first, the summary of the talk today, and then we'll go in the detail. Let's see if I can do a good job at just presenting that summary in 30 seconds. The control of the androgen hormone release. Number one, keep in mind that 5% of all the androgen hormones, there are many hormones that collectively are called androgens, 5% of them are released by suprarenal glands. 95% are by testis. So testosterone, 95% of that is, out of all androgens, testosterone is 95% effective, and that is produced by testis. The primary control for all of these androgens, either from suprarenal gland or from testis, is from the hypothalamus, pituitary, and then the releasing hormones that go to these glands. So in case of sex hormones, male sex hormones especially, there is an effect of the emotional state as well. And from that, that means the higher centers the executive functions of the uh, person, the personality of the person is also influenced by the hormones and the personality can influence the hormones. Similarly, a man's, because we're talking about androgen, a man's exposure to the sexual content itself can also affect the production of the hormones. There was a study done in which they exposed younger um, animals to sexual content and they saw that they started developing or secreting androgens early on. So this is the, this is the basic um, discussion today. What I will be doing is I'm going to go over what are the effects in hypothalamus, then the pituitary, then what happens in suprarenal, and then what happens in testis, and then at the end of the discussion, I'll discuss about some foods as well that can impact androgen production. So let's start. So once again, quick summary. Summary is that hypothalamus releases CRH or corticotropic releasing hormones. These hormones go to pituitary, which is another uh, gland attached just under the hypothalamus and I believe it is uh, pronounced as pituitary so give me a chance to pronounce the way I am uh, then pituitary has an anterior part and a posterior part anterior part releases ad ACTH adrenocorticotropic hormone this hormone acts on suprarenal glands which are the glands above the kidneys and then it affects the secretion of androgens over there. That's only 5%. 95% of this all is that hypothalamus releases gonadotropin releasing hormones. Hypothalamus you would see would release releasing hormones. Those releasing hormones then work on pituitary and cause further action. So once the gonadotropin releasing hormones are released from hypothalamus, they act on pituitary, and pituitary in response would produce follicle stimulating hormone or FSH and LH. FSH in men helps with spermatogenesis, and luteinizing hormone or LH is the primary hormone that helps produce testosterone from testis. This is the 95% of the production of androgens. And here is a quick structure as we see the diagrams. This 
up here is the hypothalamus in the brain, in the above the brain stem, in the central part of the brain. With hypothalamus is pituitary, and pituitary has two parts, anterior pituitary and posterior pituitary. And we'll talk more in detail. And then the effect is on the suprarenal gland. That is one. The second effect is here. And once again, there is behavior of a person. We are talking men. Then that affects the hypothalamus. And I'll go in detail for this as well. Hypothalamus releases gonadotropin releasing hormone. That then affects pituitary, which then releases utilizing hormone or follicle stimulating hormone. Those then go and act on testis. And in the testis, there are cells called Leydig cell and Sertoli cells. Leydig cells, under the influence of luteinizing hormone, produce testosterone. Sertoli cells, under the influence of follicle stimulating hormone plus testosterone that is produced by the Leydig cell, will then in turn produce sperms or help produce sperm and support sperm and, and so on. So this is the summary of all of it. We are done with the summary. If you just wanted to know this much, we, we are cool. Now I'm going to go in the details. So first of all, if we are trying to understand that how are androgens produced, why are they produced? So of course, we know that they are produced uh, in women and in men very tiny quantity in women for the musculinizing hormone or the male sex hormones, more quantity in men. And so what is the main control? The control is bilateral with personality. That is the first part. This is what, what they say, you know, it's all in, in the head. So the personality part or behavioral part is affected by the hormones and behavior can affect the release of the hormone. Then hypothalamus receives almost all inputs for, for, from our sensory systems. So for example, if you are or if a person is excited or depressed, hypothalamus receives that input to say this person at this time is happy or depressed. If there is feeling of pain, that pain as our brain senses the pain, a portion of that pain stimulus or signal is also sent to hypothalamus to say we are feeling pain. Even olfaction, the smell, it goes to amygdala, but there is a part of olfaction that is sent to hypothalamus as well. Hypothalamus is also connected with the limbic system too. So emotional parts are also relayed to hypothalamus. Hypothalamus is also con uh, connected with our anterior part of the brain or frontal lobe, which is our executive part, which is our personality part. And that also has a bilateral exchange with hypothalamus. So first thing here, personality. Then the second thing is the hypothalamus. Personality includes our external behavior and observation and environment as well. So when we have, we are sitting somewhere, standing, we are present somewhere, our personality is a lot of input, not only from our internal environment, from, but from our external environment and then our learnings and then our behaviors. Hypothalamus is interested in our internal environment. So as much as external environment and personality influences it, all internal environment is influencing the hypothalamus as well. Because of that, hypothalamus is then able to help control body's environment by sending various executive orders to various glands. It is the superior executive branch to manage our hormones and internal systems. In addition to various sensory stimuli, our composition of the blood, that means the amount of water in the blood or dilution of the blood, osmolality of the blood, nutrients in the blood, so how much is the glucose present, how much salt is present, how much potassium is present and so on. All those things, water content, nutrients, other hormones, they also affect hypothalamus. 
So hypothalamus at all time is fully engaged and knows external and internal state. Now what happens next? Once the hypothalamus knows about an internal environment, let's just focus on the internal side. There are two ways hypothalamus reacts or functions. One way is hypothalamus functions through the anterior pituitary. And my apologies for the pronunciation for pituitary. This is what I know how to do it. I'll continue to improve. But this is the anterior pituitary is what hypothalamus works in one case. In the other case, hypothalamus also works with the posterior pituitary. Now, it is interesting that posterior part of the pituitary or the posterior pituitary is developed from neuronal tissue. Hence, the connection of hypothalamus with the posterior pituitary is neuronal in nature. So neurons in the hypothalamus, various parts of the hypothalamus, they send their exons that end in the posterior pituitary and release their chemical substances there and influence the action of posterior pituitary. Today, we are not concerned with the posterior pituitary. So this is all I would talk about for that topic. We would stay uh, more thorough with the anterior one. Now, anterior pituitary, interestingly, does not develop from neuronal tissue. It actually develops from the oropharyngeal tissue, the epithelial tissue, the surface. When we are developing in our mothers, the area inside the mouth is actually an open area. It's a surface of our body, just like skin is a surface. And there are the cells there are epithelial cells. Skin or surface cells are called epithelial cells. Some of those cells produce something called a Rathke's pouch. That pouch becomes a small purse-like thing and that ascends and connects with the pituitary or under the hypothalamus and that makes anterior pituitary. This is why anterior pituitary is epithelial in nature, number one. Number two, hypothalamus connects with that, not through neuronal tissues, but instead through blood. So the command from hypothalamus to anterior pituitary goes via blood. The commands from hypothalamus to posterior pituitary go through the neuronal tissue because posterior pituitary is part of the neuronal tissue. That's a very interesting thing. So the healthcare professionals and students here, we know that there is hypothalamic, hypophysial portal system. What does that mean? What is a portal system? A portal system is something where a connection between two places to points a connection is made through the blood system but the connection is made in a in a way that there is capillaries in the beginning then there are some blood vessels and then there are sinuses at the end or you can say broken tissue broken branches of the blood vessels they collect they start from there they collect together to make trunk then they break up into branches as well. This is called a portal system. We have a portal system in our GIT as well. So hypothalamus, thalamus has a portal system. Now here is very interesting thing. How does it work? When hypothalamus wants to give an order to the anterior pituitary, what it does is it has neurons in various parts of it that will make the releasing or inhibitory hormones that need to go to anterior pituitary. So there are neurons that are going to make it. However, because hypothalamus cannot directly connect with the anterior pituitary, there is a blood-brain barrier involved. Nervous tissue does not connect with non-nervous tissue easily. So what happens is these neurons, if you see, see here, I'm going to zoom in. These neurons in the hypothalamus, they will make releasing hormones and they would spill them in a place in the pituitary which is called median eminence. Median eminence, so this is a pituitary stack. Stack is just a little uh, branch of the tissue. Or, and then above the stack, there is this part that is called median eminence. 
median eminence is where the nervous system cells from hypothalamus release chemical substances. It's a beautiful mechanism. Those chemicals are then picked up by blood system. These capillaries over here are making the portal system. So they take those chemicals, then they become blood vessels, a couple of branches. They go all the way to anterior pituitary. Over there, they divide in sinuses again, and they bring those chemicals to the interior pituitary. This is how hypothalamus sends controls just downstairs, one step below. And that is either a releasing hormone or an inhibitory hormone. So now let's talk about what are those hormones, those releasing or inhibitory, inhibitory hormones. So once again, we started with personality's effect. Then we started with hypothalamus as the main executive of controlling our internal environment and especially the endocrine system's behavior. Now that executive is sending chemical orders, mostly releasing hormones to anterior pituitary. So what are those hormones? So if you see here, this side is hypothalamus. For example, hy hypothalamus sends thyroid releasing hormone or TRH. As a result of that, anterior pituitary would listen to that and say, okay, I'm going to create thyroid stimulating hormone. Then thyroid stimulating hormone would go to thyroid and say, hey, thyroid, you need to make some more thyroid and release it. And thyroid would say, okay, boss, I listen to you and I'm going to make some thyroid. So three steps, hypothalamus sent releasing hormone, Pituitary, anterior pituitary, listened to that and said, okay, fine, I'll make releasing hormones or stimulating hormones. Then that, those are sent down to the actual gland and the gland would do its function. Couple of interesting things here. Number one, this is really important and interesting. Number one, the growth hormone, when hypothalamus tells pituitary, to release growth hormone, pituitary does not send the, the order to another gland. Instead, pituitary itself produces the growth hormone. For example, in case of the thyroid, hypothalamus would send an order to pituitary to say, please order thyroid to function. Pituitary would then send an order to thyroid to say, hey, you function, and then thyroid would function. In case of growth hormone, that does not happen. Hypothalamus sends a message to pituitary and pituitary itself acts as a gland to release growth hormone. Or hypothalamus can ask the pituitary to not release growth hormone and pituitary would not. So in one case, pituitary is acting as a gland itself. Although they're all glands, they're all releasing hormones. Another interesting thing is the prolactin in women the milk letting or expression of milk from breast by default is set in a way that the breast would always make and express milk. Then it is the higher centers, hypothalamus and pituitary's job to keep the milk expression suppressed. So that means normally when a woman is not making milk, it is because the higher centers are suppressing it actively. And when milk is needed, when there is a baby and there is an expression of milk that is needed, or when there is stimulation of nipples and the milk is needed, then the higher centers stop suppressing the lower centers and milk expression starts. This becomes a problem as well when many time in um, motor vehicle accidents, when there is a whiplash, when somebody's head comes to rest after they're going fast, or when they have a whiplash, when some, something hits them from behind, let's say the car, and their head goes in a jerky movement, that can cause 
this stack, this stack of the pituitary can break. When that breaks, and sometimes there are tumors of the pituitary, there is inflammation of the pituitary, there can be many reasons, but motor vehicle accidents is a very interesting common problem that a woman could come to a doctor and say, I had an accident two or three weeks ago, and now I continue to have milk expressed or colostrum ex uh, expressed from my breasts. And the problem is that as there is damage to the pituitary control from the hypothalamus because of the stack becoming broken, hypothalamus does not stop the pituitary to stop the breast from expressing milk, and the result is breast start expressing milk. So these are two interesting deviations in this process. Otherwise, the normal process is hypothalamus would send a releasing order to pituitary, which is just below it. In response to that, pituitary would say, fine, I'll make a hormone, which is then going to go and act on a gland and ask that gland to work. Now, which two hormones we want to keep in mind here? Number one, gonadotropin releasing hormone, because in men, that is the one that eventually would cause luteinizing hormone to come out from the pituitary. And luteinizing hormone is the one that would act on the Leydig cells in the, test, in the testis to produce testosterone. So this is the most important axis. If today's lecture you forget everything and just want to remember one thing, that will be hypothalamus produces GnRH, gonadotropin releasing hormone, that causes pituitary to produce luteinizing hormone and FSH or LH and FSH. LH acts on testis. We're talking about men here. It would act on testis, Leydig cells, which will then produce testosterone. That's it. If you just wanted to have one sentence for this lecture, that's it. That's the sentence. The other hormone to keep in mind today is the this one corticotropic releasing hormone that would cause a corticotropic releasing hormone from the hypothalamus will cause anterior pituitary release adrenocorticotropic hormone which would then cause suprarenal glands to produce androgens so androgens are being produced by suprarenal and testis okay continuing here we have two kidneys we're talking about suprarenal glands now we have two kidneys. On the top of the kidneys live suprarenal glands. One of the glands look more like a semi-lunar shape. Imagine that the kidneys are wearing a hat. And one of them is wearing that little classy, fancy, semi-lunar hat. And the other one's hat is old style pyramidal hat. The suprarenal glands are about four grams in size. If you take a suprarenal gland and you look at the structure of it, like many other glands, it has a cortex or the outer part and a medulla or the inner part. You can call it a seed of the gland. It's not a seed, but central part. In case of suprarenal glands, the medulla is 20% in the center. This is the gland. Medulla is the part that helps with sympathetic nervous system. This is what produces epinephrine and norepinephrine. And if I connect that to the natural killer cells, production of epinephrine will cause reduced function of natural killer cells and reduced production of natural killer cells. Outside of the medulla, so here this blue one is medulla. Outside of medulla is cortex. Cortex in suprarenal gland is divided into three layers. And when we were in medical school, we used to remember them by saying, the deeper you go, the sweeter it becomes. And the reason is that the outermost layer, the one that I made in yellow over here, this layer is called zona glomerulosa. That is because of the cellular appearance in there. And it is the function of this layer or the cells over here is to produce mineralocorticoids. Mineralocorticoids, as the name is minerals, 
their function is to work with sodium, potassium, and minerals. So they are salty, right? So our sodium balance, potassium balance is helped by aldosterone. Water balance is helped by aldosterone, which is a potent uh, hormone coming from this layer. So that is the salty part. If you go one layer deeper, that is zona fasciculata. Zona fasciculata releases glucocorticoids. Glucocorticoids are, of course, responsible with the glucose metabolism or homeostasis in addition to insulin. So insulin is the one, and then these are the ones too. So a little more sweet. And then more deeper in the cortex, this red part, the cells here are called zona reticularis, and they are the ones that produce androgens. So that is the, for the men, that is the sex hormone production. Again, I'll repeat it, only 5% of all the androgens are produced here. So suprarenals are not the main player in producing steroid hormones. 95% of the testosterone or androgen, that is testosterone, comes from testis. Now, what are the hormones very quickly? Mineralocorticoid main hormone is aldosterone. There are other two. Glucocorticoids, cortisol is the main hormone here. Androgens from here, B, hydroepiandrostine, then androstine dione, then some estrogen, some glucocorticoid as well. All of these layers can produce the other layers' hormones a little bit, but they have their own primary function. The medulla here produces the catecholamines or sympathetic. Chemicals. Now, testosterone. So, going to the ninety-five percent side, the the tes testosterone side. So, testes have multiple cells in them. One important cell, interstitial cell. Interstitial cell means the cells that are just making up the tissue of the testes. They are called Leydig cell. Leydig cells, under the influence of the luteinizing hormone, make testosterone. Now, please remember for all androgens, it is important that cholesterol be present. Cholesterol is important to make androgen hormones or steroid hormones. All androgen hormones are steroid hormones. Or we can we may use acetyl CoA as well to make these. So that means cholesterol has an important role to produce testosterone. And so there are many studies that try to produce the association of less cholesterol, would that cause less testosterone, or more testosterone from exogenous use. For example, if somebody has less testosterone produced, as men age, their production of testosterone reduces. That means their libido, their sex, their, their uh, muscle mass, their strength that starts reducing and there could be a management by giving exogenous testosterone. And so there have been many studies to try to connect that will that cause a reduction in cholesterol or not. So there is no, no clear evidence there, but just remember this much that cholesterol is necessary first step for production of uh, steroid hormones. So we cannot just be all the time upset with cholesterol. Now, once testosterone is produced, we did this discussion yesterday, the physiological and pharmacological effects of testosterone. And why am I doing this whole series? Eventually, what I want to do is that when we look at pro-androgen drugs or agonists, or when we look at anti-androgen drugs, we can understand the mechanisms behind this whole thing so we can say, okay, now we have an androgen receptor blocker. We understand how would it work. You don't even need me to say it because you can look at these lectures and then you know how androgens work. And if I say the receptor is blocked, then you can actually say what are the functions of it. That is the point of doing these discussions. So back here, when testosterone is produced, it is very rapidly used. 
it is supposed to be used within 30 minutes to a few hours. If we you do not use it, if our cells do not use it, then testosterone is very rapidly eliminated by liver. This is why a continuous supply of testosterone is needed. It is not that some amount is released and that is just sitting in the body forever. So it is rapidly degraded if not used. So what is the use? A major use of testosterone is in prostate gland. And that is where the problem occurs as well. Because we discussed this yesterday. In the prostate, testosterone will be converted to dihydrotestosterone. And the function over there would actually cause test prostate gland to continue to grow in addition to doing the, uh, the contribution to semen. And uh, prostate does other functions too. For example, cl closing the urethra at the time of ejaculation. So ejaculation does not go back towards the bladder and so on. But here, what we are interested in is the use of testosterone. So testosterone is, of course, used in other body tissues as well. It is also used in prostate. If testosterone is not picked up by these tissues, then liver picks it up. And you know that with every blood circulation, our blood passes through liver. And so when it passes through liver and liver notices a steroid hormone to be present, what it will do is it will degrade that. It would break it down. And how would it break it down? It would convert that into androstene dione and dihydroepiandrostene. The, then it would conjugate that with glu glucuronic acid. That's a normal function of liver. It conjugates various substances, make them water soluble, throw them in urine or throw them in feces. That is a normal behavior of, of the liver. So it does that conjugation. Now the molecule is modified. It is ready to be eliminated and it can be thrown out either through the bile and GIT route, fecal route, or through urine. So that is how testosterone is very quickly removed if not used. And now the final part. Generally, of course, it is important for us to have correct amounts of cholesterol available to make these hormones. It is also important for us to have the correct functioning structures available to make these hormones. A boy before puberty does not have functional Leydig cells. So even when there can be an order to make testosterone, they just do not have the factories to make it. And then after puberty, they have the tissue that would make it in, in the testis. In addition to cholesterol, in addition to working correct liver, correct testes, hypothalamus, pituitary, the um, fish which have vitamin D or foods that have zinc, they increase or they help produce more testosterone. When we were young, we were not very um, wise at that time or um, not wise even now. <laughs> but anyways, when we were young, maybe 14, 15, uh, our mother used to say, don't eat fish. It will make you warm. So now I understand that fish can actually cause men to produce more testosterone and that can increase their libido. So sometimes men, when they eat fish, they can have a, a change in libido. So tuna, salmon, sardines, they have vitamin D. Then shellfish, crabs, lobsters, they have zinc. Beef has zinc as well. And beef have vitamin D as well. So some of these foods can actually help produce more testosterone. And they could have an effect which is due to testosterone. So this is the uh, discussion. Again, the point of, uh, and again, fortified milk can be taken, yogurt can be taken, cereals can be taken, vitamin D itself can be taken. And once again, the point of these discussions is to create an overall picture of how androgens work so that when we start talking about drugs that modulate them, 
then we are clear that why are these drugs doing what they do? So this is the discussion for today. Thank you very much. Please uh, like, subscribe, and share. If <laughs> somebody commented on the <laughs> funny glasses. So um, if you want to just help, you know, free, you can just like it. And that is uh, sufficient help. In addition to that, if you would like to support this work, there are three links in the description. One is to be a patron. Another one is to buy me a coffee. And another one is to use PayPal to support us. And final comment for today, YouTube, just, just before I was going to go live, I received that um, <laughs> little update from YouTube, which said, content removed, removed content. So my talk with Dr. Pierre, Dr. Pierre Corey, Ivermectin, let's help end the pandemic. They have removed it for medical misinformation. And that has given me a warning as well. So <clears throat> things are becoming as hot as they can be. Looks like some people have eaten fish. So <laughs> with this, I would see you in a few minutes for a chit chat. Now, please remember tomorrow's talk with Dr. Daryl DeMello is 9.30 a.m. Pacific time tomorrow. We will not have a talk in the evening. We'll just have one talk in the morning. And I'm going to try to keep my chit chat today shorter so that I can be ready for tomorrow. So with this, thank you very much. And I'll see you in a few minutes again.